So if I'm right, we're talking about the theory of local anesthesia. So, good. Really, local anesthesia is your gold standard analgesic. They completely block transmission of the painful stimulus. So they are the true analgesic. Analgesia means without pain. Everything else you can say is just hypoalgesia. It's everything else we talk about, uh, opioids, non-steroids, they're all just dulling uh, the transmission of that stimulus. Local anesthetics really are absolute gold standard analgesics. And uh, you're all here because you want to use them more, which is fantastic. So. As far as the nerves go that we are looking to block, obviously we have a lot of mixed nerves um, and they have sensory and motor components as well. So our large myelinated A-beta, um, these transmit non-painful mechanical stimuli. So we're not really interested in blocking them. They can become involved in transmitting painful stimuli in chronic pain. So you can get this crossover where the A-betas become active. And because they have such their big nerves with rapid transmission, um, they can contribute quite badly to chronic pain. It's really the small myelinated A-delta and C fibers. So these are both small fibers, but obviously our A-deltas, they're myelinated. So the transmission along those nerves is a lot quicker and they're responsible for the first pain, so that's the first pain we feel. The C, the unmyelinated fibres, they, they transmit quite slowly, and it's activation of those C fibres that causes the dull ache that you feel, are, are the after effect you feel after pain. So I think when, if you've been into hospital, you've had, say, orthopaedic surgery, you might not feel that intense shooting pain, but you just have that really horrible dull ache and that's activation of your, it's your C fibres that are entirely responsible for that. We've already seen actually talking about the trip V1 receptor that sodium channels are really important in our nociceptors and obviously sodium channels are responsible for conduction of the <coughs> stimulus along the nerves and there's a lot of research looking at specific sodium channels as targets for potential future drug therapy. So reasons to use local anesthesia. Um, CNS exposure to noxious stimuli um, is reduced and dulled with anesthesia, but we can completely eliminate it with good local anesthetic technique. We know that un just because you're unconscious doesn't mean that that barrage of stimulus is not going on. We can anesthetize a patient um, with just some propofol and we do nothing to, to prevent any noxious stimulus that may then occur to that patient. We hope to create a much smoother anaesthetic and we hope to gain better control of post-stop pain and as I said I really do think we see that. And as far as patient group comparisons go in human studies, um, if you speak to people that have had a good local anaesthetic technique compared to those that haven't, um, they report that as far as uh, the satisfaction with their anaesthetic, people are a lot more satisfied with how their anaesthetic was. Um, I think it's quite an interesting thing, asking patients, how satisfied were you with your anaesthesia? So. <laughs> I can imagine it's, that's the nurse's task and not the anaesthetist's task. If, if the patient wasn't happy, the anaesthetist doesn't want to know. <laughs> and we can see that local anaesthesia has a huge role in both multimodal preemptive and preventive analgesia. So as far as the actual drugs, a bit of pharmacology on local anaesthetics, we know the physical pro properties of the drugs are related to their chemical structure. And we have a basic key um, group here. We have the intermediate chain with an aromatic and an amino uh, group at either end. And it's this intermediate link um, that makes all the difference. So you can either have an ester linked group, an example of that will be procaine, or the commonly used local anaesthetics we use, the amide links would be lidocaine, levobupivacaine, and ropivacaine. And ester-linked local anaesthetics are characterized by poor tissue penetration and short duration of action. So procaine, um, it's, I think it's the only licensed local anaesthetic in the UK. It's licensed for cattle practice, um, but it's not particularly good local anaesthetic, so we don't tend to use it very much um, apart from cattle work but we would be using the amide-linked groups here more commonly. 
desirable characteristics of our local anaesthetics. We want something that's rapid in onset, but we want a really long duration of action. We don't want drugs that are toxic, and we want drugs with low side effects. Now really, local anaesthetics, very few side effects that we see from local anaesthetics. Of course there is no ideal drug and you can pick and choose whether you use lidocaine or bupivacaine or ropivacaine depending on the, si the situation. Should we use polypharmacy? Should we combine the drugs? Um, there have been studies looking at combinations of lidocaine and bupivacaine so in theory you get a short onset and you get um, a long duration of action. Um, the studies looking at lidocaine bupivacaine versus just bupivacaine weren't able to, to show that there was any benefit to it. So yes, I know some people do it. I did it for a while. I don't do it anymore. I just use straight bupivacaine now. So um, I very rarely combine local anaesthetic agents. So local anaesthetics reversibly block sodium channels in the nerve and therefore prevent membrane depolarization and they stop the development and transmission of electrical currents in all excitable tissues. So ideally, we want to, to stop that transmission in neurons. The, the, the compounds exist in ionized and non-ionized forms, and it's the non-ionized form that we need to diffuse through the membrane, but then we need to um, convert that form. That form needs to be converted to the ionized form to be able to actually block the sodium channel. We know that tissue pH does affect ionisation and it's something that we're always taught. Um, you would probably never use a local anaesthetic in somewhere that was uh, an acidic environment such as an infected wound anyway. So um, we tend to do our nerve blocks. If you had a situation where you had a horrible wound, then you would try and perform a nerve block distant to that area. So you're not going through tissue that, that, is that has, contains infection. Of course, we're aiming to block, we, we ideally want to block our sensory nerves and not the motor nerves, but invariably, yes, we do block motor, motor nerves. It's not a massive disaster, but yes, we're, we're aiming to block the C fibers, the small di diameter unmyelinated fibers. Um, because they're small, they are more susceptible to local anaesthetic blockade. Uh, the motor nerves are a little bit more resistant. So we do see this pattern of, of block whereby the C fibers should become blocked first. So you get a sensory block, but you can still maintain some motor function. And we see the reverse of that is true when the block comes to wear off. So if you have seen some motor blockade, you will get motor function back before you get sensory function back. So if you've done an epidural with bupivacaine, you may well have motor dysfunction in that dog for maybe three hours, but your bupivacaine is going to last for six to eight hours. So just because the dog's walking doesn't mean the epidural is not working. I think some people expect you've done an epidural, therefore that dog should be paralysed non-ambulatory. That's not necessarily the case. And if you've done cruciate surgery, it may well be three hours that the dog's actually anaesthetised for. So by the time it goes to recovery, it might have full motor function. We know that in myelinated nerves that we need to actually block three uh, successive nodes of RONVA to uh, block that stimulus being transmitted. And from some quite clever uh, lab physiology studies, there is this distance of two centimetres that you need to cover in order to sex successfully block three to five nodes, uh, nodes of RONVA. So in all of the, if you read any papers on the subject um, after today, if they're doing a dissection study where they're then dissecting the nerve out, what they should be looking for is that they've actually blocked with their, the people they incorporate dye into their local anaesthetics in these studies, you should see a pattern of two centimetres coverage of that nerve um, to say that that nerve block was successful. All of the drugs we use are toxic. Um, be it uh, local anaesthesia or sedation, everything is toxic, it's all dose related. We know that prolonged sodium blockage is fatal. Obviously we have uh, sodium channels in the heart are so quite important, we don't really want to block those. Um, lidocaine, you have to go really high with lidocaine to block, uh, to cause any, any degree of toxicity. But bupivacaine and ropivacaine, these drugs are both quite cardiotoxic, so we would never use either of them intravenously because they bind to the sodium channels 
and they hang on. They don't let go very easily, which is why um, they are they're cardiotoxic because they bind to those those um, uh, cardiac sodium channels. As far as systemic intoxication by local anaesthetics goes, even if we did overdose a patient, our patients are probably anaesthetised, so we don't tend to see any of this. What you do tend to see though, and I have seen when I've been using a lidocaine infusion, um, if the lidocaine levels get a little bit too high, let's say you've got, you know I talked before about a hypoproteinemic dog, you need to balance your dose rate against the dog's protein levels. If you get the dose a little bit wrong, Kind of this is where, what you'll see, the dog will be just a little bit abnormal, a bit head bobby, a bit twitchy, maybe a bit of nystagmus. So um, that's probably the best example I've seen of, of um, systemic intoxication by local anaesthetics. I don't really want to be seeing any of my patients up here. Um, it very, that is the only time I've ever seen I've never seen any of this by performing local anaesthesia. So you can go away in confidence that if you administer a recommended dose, you're not going to see toxicity or side effects. Those are the toxic doses. We'll come to the recommended doses. So which agents do we have available? We have lidocaine, very commonly used. Fast onset, duration of action one to two hours, toxicity is low, but I would always calculate, I would never go above 10 mg per kg with lidocaine. And actually four mg per kg with lidocaine gets you a really long way. We do need to think if we're using, do you have a, um, laryngeal desensitized, do you have intravies here? But you have a similar spray for desensitized and feline larynx. Intravies that we use in the UK is about two to four milligrams per spray. So if you were using it on a really tiny uh, patient, then you need to take that into account when you're calculating um, your overall toxic dose for doing local anesthetic techniques subsequently. Um, the other thing you can do if you don't like the spray is just use straight lidocaine on the feline larynx, that's fine. Bupivacaine, um, the trade name that we have is Marcaine. Um, it's onset, we say, is slow, probably about 20 minutes. And duration of action can be anything from four to eight hours. And as a guideline dose, I'd be using one to two mg per kg. I never go above two mg per kg for bupivacaine. And as I said before, it's really important to aspirate when you're doing these techniques. This is a, a nerve locator needle. We've performed our technique, we've aspirated before we injected, and we've got blood, so we've abandoned this, this local anaesthetic technique. Ropivacaine, very similar profile to bupivacaine. Um, you can use each of those drugs completely interchangeably, and because of supply problems we have to in the UK. We're using ropivacaine at the moment because we can't get hold of bupivacaine or levobupivacaine. And procaine, we're not going to talk about. So what exactly is a safe dose of local anaesthetic? Well, what I would always do is work out for bupivacaine or ropivacaine, your two mg per kg is your maximum dose. So you just work it out, work out the volume you've got, and then split that between whatever you need to do. So don't use any more. For lidocaine, as I say, four mg per kg goes far enough. We need to know whether our blocks worked or not. So we should see minimal reaction to surgical stimulus. If in that anaesthetized patient, when the surgeon starts, you don't see any response, your nerve blocks works perfectly well. We need to remember to turn the volatile agent down though. Remember we said one of, the, one of our goals of anaesthesia is to make sure our blood pressure is normal. Um, if we ignore the vaporizer setting and our blocks work really nicely, then we may well have a dog that's deeper than we actually need them to be. So um, I just go back to the absolute basics as far as jaw tone, uh, puppy reflex go, and eye position, and turn the vaporizer down as appropriate. And we would be expecting low pain scores post-operatively. As I said to you, um, orthopedic cruciate surgery, I would expect a pain score anywhere between one and two out of one and four out of twenty-four on the Glasgow pain scale. What we definitely need to remember is if we've done a really, really good block and you come out of theatre, the dog won't necessarily need any more opioids at that point. So you can pain score the dog and then give opioids depending on. A, the dog's pain score, or B, how long you think that block's going to work. 
So if I've done, say, a femoral sciatic nerve block with bupivacaine, I know it's going to last about four to six to eight hours. So I will plan my pain scoring according to the duration of action and we'll give the dog methadone as necessary. So we won't necessarily blanket give those drugs. But we need to have some idea of when the block's going to wear off because we know from people when they wake up um, without any other analgesia, when the block wears off, it's really, people that would say they're really sore. Yeah, I was really, really fine, and then the block wore off, and it, the pain was hideous. So um, I think we can be a little bit better than our human colleagues in, in monitoring our patients for pain. I think you talk to lots of people in hospital, and they say, well, I asked for morphine, I asked for it five times, and finally I got it three hours later. So um, we can do better than that. Why did my block not work? It's quite a blank slide, um, which means we don't always know. Um, one thing we talk about with epidurals is getting a patchy block, which you can people describe with bupivacaine. So you may well find there are areas where the block just didn't work. And I've had this talking to some of our nurses that have um, had epidurals when they've had their babies. And a couple of them said, yeah, I just had this little patch here that, where the epidural didn't work, and that's what you describe as a patchy block. Now, maybe we see that with dogs. We, we don't necessarily know whether we see that with dogs and cats, but I don't see why we, we, we wouldn't. One thing people say is that if you were to warm the local anaesthetic, you may well avoid a patchy block. One of the things that I actually do is use a yoghurt maker and put the local anaesthetic in it and turn it on for an hour at the beginning of the day and it just warms the local anaesthetic from, say, about 20 degrees room temperature, um, just up to a little bit warmer, more like body temperature, or just carry the local around in your pocket for half an hour or so, just to warm it a little bit more. Difficult to study scientifically to work out whether that actually makes a difference though. With some of the nerve blocks, um, particularly the limb nerve blocks. With the nerve locator, you can get a really good response, so you know that you're right next to the nerve. But what you might not know is that there's, you could be, if this was the nerve here, but this is a fascial plane, your needle might be the other side of that fascial plane, yet it's still stimulating the nerve. When you inject, your local just runs right down the fascial plane. That's something that's quite difficult to tell with just using nerve locator stimulation and people that are advocates of using ultras an ultrasound guided approach where you actually visualize the injection on the ultrasound and you see the local anesthetic spread around the nerve and they get what's called the donut sign where they can see the local around the nerve. That would be one of the advantages of using ultrasound over a nerve locator technique to in improve your accuracy. So you don't always know exactly where you are in regards to a fascial plane, which may explain sometimes why the block didn't work. See this little video works? Yeah, it's going to work. Um, this is, when I was a resident, you say to the surgeons, oh yeah, I want to do this technique. Oh no, no, that's going to impair my wound healing. It's the first thing they throw at you, but there's, a, I can't remember when it was published, it was 2007, 2010. Um, this study looking at um, uh, wound healing in mice showed that local anaesthetic doesn't impair cutaneous wound healing, so we're not worried about it. What you will notice from this video is this was one of our surgeons doing this technique. Can someone critique his technique for me, please? If I play the video again. What's he not doing? Yeah, he's not aspirating. So I said, John, I've made this beautiful video and you didn't aspirate. <laughs> Very naughty boy. <laughs> that was lidocaine. <laughs> um, do you have Emla cream? Yeah, I think sometimes it, it's obviously it's a mixture of lidocaine and prilocaine and we talked before about combining agents and this is actually one agent. Um, eutectic mixture means when you combine two agents their individual properties become one similar property. This is one example where we know that does actually happen so because we've got lidocaine and prilocaine together Normally, if you put lidocaine, uh, if you spotted it topically on there, it wouldn't really do very much, but the combination of the two means that it becomes a topical solution. I think it is quite useful for, if you've got a, Wrigley, a dog Wrigley saphenous catheters, our nurses are completely obsessed with slathering emla cream all over everything. Um, and I think Wrigley bunnies as well, put it on the ear, wrap the bunnies ear, and all, the other thing that's nice is you get vasodilation with it as well, so it makes rabbit veins a lot easier to hit. I don't really think there's any point in putting emla cream on 
and then pre-medding the patient with an opioid and then putting an IV catheter in because they should have really good analgesia from the opioid and not really need the amla cream. I keep trying to explain this to the nurses but they don't really <laughs> get it. <laughs> And don't forget about topical anaesthetics as well. If we're doing anything ocular, we can use something like proxymetacaine. It's a low irritation, but it's very short duration, so we need to, we, it's useful if we, um, we need to repeat it if we're going to use it. So wound catheters. This catheter here is a commercially available catheter from Myla, but you can make your own from very fine feeding tubes. You would just use um, a, a heat source like a lighter to seal over the end of the tube and then cut holes down the tube if you want to make your own, but you can get them commercially. You can see here, this is from this black line here, that's where that picture starts, and you've just got these little pores, and it would be this part that you laid in your, your wound, and then you can use this to tunnel under another piece of skin and then exit at the, the connector there. And then what we do, you can buy filters as well from the same company. We just screw a filter on there and then you just inject through a bun. They're really useful for things like amputations, mammary strips, if you've got a big area of a tumour resection, um, skin flaps, and they have been studied in total ear canal ablations as well. Now, you can get various lengths, and the length refers to the length from here to here. Okay, so you can get two, two, five, seven, nine, and there's another one, as there are five sizes. Um, to us, they're 17 99 so they're quite expensive. It's probably about $30, $35, so they're quite a lot. Um, but if you've um, done an incredibly extensive surgery and you want to provide amazing analgesia, this is going to reduce your opioid requirement. For, certainly for us, um, methadone and buprenorphine are both licensed products, so it makes them quite expensive at home. If you can do a really good local anaesthetic technique and reduce your opioid requirements, then you're saving money in that regard as well. Potentially, probably save the money um, through the re reduction in opioid requirements. And of course, local anaesthetics are dead cheap as well. Bupivacaine is quite cheap. And for this, I would use one to two mg per kg of bupivacaine every six to eight hours or it's described um, two mg per kg per hour of lidocaine as a CRI. So you can actually attach onto the end of this, you can add an extension set and attach that to a syringe driver and then that just delivers lidocaine continuously. A little bit more difficult to maintain if the animal's moving around the kennel, you don't really want them to pull the catheter out. So personally I prefer intermittent dosing with bupivacaine and find it works really well. Oh, the filter just screws on there. Um, it's just to filter the drug, just in case there are any, any particulate matter. You don't really want to put anything into the clean wound. I mean, we do it in a sterile fashion anyway, so you're opening in a sterile vial of local anaesthetic solution, but it's what the company recommends. It's probably belt and braces approach, really. If you, can, if you don't have that in stock, you can just make that out of a demonstrated Yeah. Yeah. These are a soft, a softer material. If you had like a, do you have those slippery Sam catheters that are really, yeah, they're nice and soft, aren't they? So, yes. Do you add anything in um, to avoid the spinning of What I normally do is if I'm placing these at surgery, as soon as they're placed, then put the bupivacaine down while the patient's still anaesthetised and they don't normally feel it. And then if your interval is correct and the local isn't wearing off, then you should avoid the stinging. What you can do if you do find that it stings in the patient, is just warm some lidocaine beforehand, put the lidocaine down first, because then that will eliminate the stinging from the bupivacaine. But I think normally it's about, when I've done this particularly, probably do it more in cats actually, if you do it six hours in cats with bupivacaine, they don't tend, it doesn't tend to sting. I do that for chest tubes as well. If you've got a chest drain and they react to the bupivacaine going down, you can put lidocaine down first of all. But I think all things like that is just nice to warm the local before it goes in. You can imagine if someone just plonked five mils of cold solution in your chest, I think that would make you jump a bit. This was a study that looked at using wound soaker catheters um, post-operatively. Um, it's a retrospective, uh, a prospect, it was a prospective study actually. 56 cases, thoracic and pelvic limb amputations. The average uh, dwell time was 1.6 days. So this creature obviously pulled its catheter out 
a few hours after surgery, which is a bit naughty. Um, but the longest they left one in was three days, which I think is about right. You probably don't need them much longer than three days. The three problems that they saw were disconnection, seroma um, formation, and lidocaine toxicity in one case, but that was because of a miscalculation of drugs. So it's not really fair to attribute that to the catheter. What they did notice based on previous, um, they, they compared this population to um, their, their previous cases of, of amputation because obviously the surgeons were quite worried, okay, I'm doing the surgery that's a clean surgery and you're going to go stick local in, is it going to increase the infection rate? And they actually showed, compared to that previous population, decreased the wound infection rates in that group. So This is the TICA study, so that would be, that's the surgical site for the total ear canal ablation and they just put the, the catheter in and laid it down there and then you've got some tubing that connects the filter here attached to the dog's collar. So that's another way of doing it. I haven't, I've never actually used a wound catheter for a TICA surgery. We tend to use, um, as you'll see in one of the later lectures, we, we do local infiltration of anaesthetics. Um, you can then put some local anaesthetic at the bottom before, before they're closed. And then we use CRIs and they tend to be quite comfortable, so. This is a little case example of a cat that had um, a thoracic limb amputation and as I said one mg per kg bupivacaine every six hours with a non-steroidal cat was pain scored and we definitely saw a reduction in opioid requirements in that cat. And actually one of our own cats he had a fibrosarcoma resected from his dorsal spine and he had a wound catheter exactly the same regimen and he was incredibly comfortable and you really can see a reduction in opioid requirements with these. This is actually one of Carl's slides, um, which was a dog that had a, a, a skin mass resective in its flank and quite an extensive um, skin flap performed. And you can see here that this is your local anaesthetic catheter, but this is your drain here. What you need to remember is that you don't want to put your local in and then drain it straight back out again. So um, if you're using one of those intermittent grenade, if you if you're using intermittent drainage and you're just draining every now and again, make sure you do the draining and then you put the local anaesthetic in. Or if you're using one of those continuous suction grenades, just take the pressure off the, the grenade for about half an hour when you put your local in and then come back and reconnect it. Yeah. But they can be really useful. So on to nerve location. So this here is the nerve locator or nerve stimulator that I use and it's a current generator and it ranges from about 0.1 milliamps to about 2 milliamps and I would use, normally use it in the range 0.1 to 1 milliamp. This is obviously the, the ground or positive electrode which just connects anywhere on the patient and this is the negative electrode that connects to the end of this wire here. The wire then connects to this needle and the needle is completely insulated so you only get currents coming out of the very tip of the needle, so it's very precise in where it stimulates. And also you get it connected to your, your local anaesthetic solution here, so you can just inject. We know that it increases accuracy as far as performing nerve blocks goes, and it does reduce the risk of nerve damage. Because what we're trying to do is use the machine to locate the nerve but then what we don't really want to do is put the needle right in the nerve and we don't really want to inject the local into the nerve, we want to inject it around the nerve. So if you start searching for the nerve on a current of around about one milliamp, once you've found the nerve then you would turn the current down, so I tend to start at one, then I turn down to 0.7, then 0.5, then 0.3. And around about 0.3, I'm looking to lose the twitch response that you see in the, the corresponding motor unit. If you've still got a twitch response at 0.2, then you're either in the nerve or too close to the nerve, so you just want to back off a little bit before you aspirate and inject. And I'll just show you an example in this. Oh, no, the video is the next one, this video. So this is performing a femoral nerve block. So the ground electro is just connected there. Oh. Oh, come on. Okay. 
just palpate with my left hand. The dog's head is this set and it's going to keep doing this. With my left hand, I'm palpating the femoral artery and that's the landmark because obviously the femoral nerve runs with the femoral artery. And I'm just going to put my needle in about five to ten millimetres just cranial to the femoral artery because I don't want to prang the femoral artery. You have to try quite hard to do that actually. It is a really big artery but you have to try quite hard to, to actually hit it. There's a challenge for you. So the, the nerve locator set to a, to point to one there. And we're just looking around for the nerve here. And what you'll see is what I'm doing is when I can't find the nerve, I'm coming right back. You can just see you've got a quadriceps twitch there, which is what you're looking for. You're looking for a quadriceps twitch or the patella moving. People describe it as a dancing patella. So you're looking for quadriceps twitch. You can see when I'm searching for the nerve, I'm not bending the needle at all. I'm going in, I'm coming back out, and I'm redirecting. If you bend the needle, one of the things you can get, you know we talked before about the fascial plane, if you've got your needle here and you push, you might contact the nerve but not actually be near the nerve. So you need to come back out and get the other side of that fascial plane. That's one of the things that people think makes a difference. You have to trust me that when I ran this video this morning, it was working absolutely fine. Your um, pointer device seems to be turning off the thing. Every time you use your pointer device, you can turn it stops off. the... So there we are, we've just got a quadriceps twitch there. Now in some dogs, the whole leg will flick with the quadriceps contraction. And you can just see the patella dancing there. So that's good. And we're just turning down to 0 0.4, 0 0.3. We've still got a bit of a twitch at 0 0.3, going down to 0 0.2, and we've just lost the twitch there. So we're gonna aspirate and inject the volume there. What some people describe is they'll go down to point 0.2 where they won't have any stimulation, then they'll want to turn back up to point 0.4 to see that they're still in the right place. One of my colleagues does that, and then she will inject while she's still got twitches, but it's just two different ways of doing it. They both are equally good ways of doing it. So, so that's a femoral nerve. So you want to lose it just down to point 0.3? So yeah, yeah. 3.3 and 0.2? Yeah. What we... We were always quite worried about intraneural injection, but there are, there's more work in people that actually intraneural injection doesn't cause the kind of post-op problems that we thought it would cause, but we still shouldn't really be aiming to, we, we shouldn't really inject intraneurally. There's another paper recently that shows that you can actually be in the nerve at a current of 0.3 and get absolutely no twitch at all. So you can be right in the nerve and you think you're not in the nerve. Um, I think that happens with a sciatic nerve block. Sometimes when I put the needle in, I don't get anything. And if I back the needle off a little bit, then you see resumption of that twitch. So you just have to be quite careful. Um, if you don't get anything, then you just need to be looking around again. Sometimes when you come back, you will get that twitch again. Let's see how this sciatic nerve block works. So we're just going off the back of the greatest trochanter here and aiming the, the sciatic nerves just running through that nice groove there and that's exactly what you want to see. That's really nice palmar twitch and you're, you're actually stimulating obviously the sciatic divides at the stifle into the tibial and the common perineal and when you get that uh, palmar flexion you're stimulating the tibial component and sometimes you see a plantar flexion when you're stimulating the perineal so you can actually isolate both bits so we've got really nice twitch there and then we're just going to turn the current down where are we now I can't quite see on that video yeah so we've lost it at 0.5 I want to be a bit more accurate at that I th we can use this nerve locator to get a little bit closer to that nerve so we've got a nice twitch at 0.7 there but just, yeah, there we go. Ooh. Yeah. Down to 0.5, and we've still got a twitch at 0.5, which is good. 
And then we just lose it when we go down to 0.3, so I'm happy there. So you want to lose your twitch either 0.3 or 0.2. If there's a twitch, you don't want to inject at 0.2. This is a really nice example, actually, of an epidural. And you can use this for locating the epidural space. I don't always perform epidurals in lateral recumbency. I prefer them in sternal recumbency. But if you're using the nerve locator technique, what you're looking for is a tail twitch, which you will see in this dog when we locate the epidural. There you go, epidural <laughs> space. So really, really nice. And <coughs> cases that I find that really useful for are if you've got a dog and it's got a femoral fracture, we don't really want to be putting that dog in sternal and hiking its legs forward. So I will perform this technique in, in those cases. Um, the last one I did was, she was a really big fat dog as well, so she's quite difficult to do an epidural and lateral anyway. If you've got the nerve locator, then you know that you're in, definitely in the right place. So Really, really nice. So I mentioned ultrasound guidance before, and really ultrasound guidance is taking it to another level. If you are interested in ultrasound and you have a nice ultrasound machine, then yeah, by all means, um, it's certainly something to explore and you can go a long way with it. But what you're aiming to see, that hyperechoic area there is the femoral nerve. That's the femoral artery there, and the femoral nerve is around here. What you can see on ultrasound is the needle comes in, and you can see the needle coming in really nicely. And then when you inject, you just get this halo around the nerve. Um, and this is really useful for, you, you can see that you're not actually in the nerve when you inject. And people will use, as you can see in this video, use um, electrical nerve stimulation in combination with ultrasound to, that's about as accurate as you can get for nerve blocks. Um, and a lot of papers at the moment, this is a, a real area of, of interest um, amongst veterinary anaesthetists and all the current papers are looking at the optimal acoustic window for seeing nerves on ultrasound. So um, the nerves that people are looking at are the lumbar plexus uh, block and um, the femoral nerve block and the sciatic nerve block are the, are the ones of interest at the moment and it's also described for an axillary block of the brachial plexus and we'll look at those during the specific lectures later. So to conclude, local anaesthesia is really widely applicable in practice, it's easy to perform, it is our gold standard analgesia and it should provide us with a nice trouble-free anaesthetic. Okay, so that is bang on 12 o'clock.